This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Ian Bartholomew, Taipei, Taiwan, on February 11, 2006. The Quest by H. H. Munro from the Chronicles of Clovis. An unwonted peace hung over the Villa Elsinore, broken, however, at frequent intervals, by clamorous lamentations suggestive of bewildered bereavement. The Mombies had lost their infant child. Hence the peace which its absence entailed. They were looking for it in wild, undisciplined fashion, giving tongue the whole time, which accounted for the outcry which swept through the house and garden whenever they returned to try the home coverts anew. Clovis, who was temporarily and unwillingly a paying guest at the villa, had been dozing in a hammock at the far end of the garden when Mrs. Momby had broken the news to him. "'We've lost the baby!' she screamed. "'Do you mean that it's dead or stampeded, or that you staked it at cards and lost it that way?' asked Clovis lazily. "'He was toddling about quite happily on the lawn,' said Mrs. Momby tearfully and Arnold had come in, and I was asking him what sort of sauce he would like with the asparagus. I hope it was Hollandaise, interrupted Clovis, with a show of quickened interest, because if there's anything I hate. And all of a sudden I missed baby, continued Mrs. Momby in a shriller tone. We've hunted high and low, in house and garden and outside the gates, and he's nowhere to be seen. Is he anywhere to be heard? asked Clovis. If not, he must be at least two miles away. But where? And how? asked the distracted lover. Perhaps an eagle or a wild beast has carried him off, suggested Clovis. There aren't eagles or wild beasts in Surrey, said Mrs. Momby, but a note of horror had crept into her voice. They escape now and then from travelling shows. Sometimes, I think, they let them get loose for the sake of the advertisement. Think what a sensational headline it would make in the local papers. Infant son of prominent nonconformist devoured by spotted hyena. Your husband isn't a prominent nonconformist, but his mother came from Wesleyan stock, and you must allow the newspapers some latitude. But we should have found his remains, sobbed Mrs. Momby. If the hyena was really hungry, and not merely toying with his food, there wouldn't be much in the way of remains. It would be like the small boy and the apple story. There ain't going to be no core. Mrs. Momby turned away hastily to seek comfort and counsel in some other direction. With the selfish absorption of young motherhood, she entirely disregarded Clovis's obvious anxiety about the asparagus sauce. Before she had gone a yard, however, the click of the side gate caused her to pull up sharp. Miss Gilpert, from the villa Peterhof, had come over to hear details of the bereavement. Clovis was already rather bored with the story, but Mrs. Momby was equipped with that merciless faculty which finds as much joy in the nineteenth time of telling as in the first. Arnold had come in. He was complaining of rheumatism. There are so many things to complain of in this household that it would never have occurred to me to complain of rheumatism, murmured Clovis. He was complaining of rheumatism, continued Mrs. Momby trying to throw a chilling inflection into a voice that was already doing a good deal of sobbing and talking at high pressure as well. She was again interrupted. "'There is no such thing as rheumatism,' said Miss Gilpert. She said it with the conscious air of defiance that a waiter adopts in announcing that the cheapest price claret in the wine list is no more. She did not proceed, however, to offer the alternative of some more expensive malady, but denied the existence of them all. Mrs. Momby's temper began to shine out through her grief. 
I suppose you'll say that Baby has really disappeared. He has disappeared, conceded Miss Gilpet, but only because you haven't sufficient faith to find him. It's only lack of faith on your part that prevents him from being restored to you safe and well. But if he's eaten in the meantime by a hyena, and partly digested, said Clovis, who clung affectionately to his wild beast theory, surely some ill effects would be noticeable. Miss Gilpert was rather staggered by this complication of the question. I feel sure that a hyena has not eaten him, she said lamely. The hyena may be equally certain that it has. You see, it may have just as much faith as you have, and more special knowledge as to the present whereabouts of the baby. Mrs. Mumby was in tears again. If you have faith, she sobbed, struck by a happy inspiration, wouldn't you find our little Eric for us? I'm, sh I'm sure you have powers that are denied to us. Rosemary Gilpert was thoroughly sincere in her adherence to the Christian science principles. Whether she understood or correctly expounded them, the learned in such matters may best decide. In the present case, she was undoubtedly confronted with a great opportunity, and as she started forth on her vague search, she strenuously summoned to her aid every scrap of faith that she possessed. She passed out into the bare and open high road, followed by Mrs. Mombay's warning. It's no use going there! We've searched there a dozen times. But Rosemary's ears were already deaf to all things save self-congratulation. For sitting in the middle of the highway, playing contentedly with the dust and some faded buttercups, was a white pinafored baby with a mop of tow-colored hair tied over one temple with a pale blue ribbon. Taking first the usual feminine precaution of looking to see that no motor car was on the distant horizon, Rosemarie dashed at the child and bore it, despite its vigorous opposition, in through the portals of Elsinore. The child's furious screams had already announced the fact of its discovery, and the almost hysterical parents raced down the lawn to meet their restored offspring. The aesthetic value of the scene was marred in some degree by Rosemary's difficulty in holding the struggling infant, which was borne wrong end foremost towards the agitated bosom of its family. "'Our own little Eric, come back to us!' cried the Mombays in unison, as the child had rammed its fists tightly into its eye sockets, and nothing could be seen of its face but a widely gaping mouth. The recognition was itself almost an act of faith." "'Is he glad to get back to Daddy and Mummy again?' crooned Mrs. Mombay. The preference which the child was showing for its dust and buttercup distractions was so marked that the question struck Clovis as being unnecessarily tactless. "'Give him a ride on the roly-poly,' suggested the father brilliantly, as the howls continued with no sign of early abatement. In a moment the child had been placed astride the big garden roller, and a preliminary tug was given to set it in motion. From the depths of the hollow cylinder came an ear-splitting roar, drowning even the vocal efforts of the squalling baby, and immediately afterwards there crept forth a white pinafored infant with a mop of tow-coloured hair tied over one temple with a pale blue ribbon. There was no mistaking either the features or the lung power of the new arrival. "'Our own little Eric!' screamed Mrs. Mombay, pouncing on him and nearly smothering him with kisses. "'Did he hide in the roly-poly to give us all a big fright?' This was the obvious explanation of the child's sudden disappearance and equally abrupt discovery. There remained, however, the problem of the interloping baby, which now sat whimpering on the lawn in a disfavour as chilling as its previous popularity had been unwelcome. The Mombies glared at it as though it had wormed its way into their short-lived affection by heartless and unworthy pretenses. 
Miss Gilpert's face took on an ashen tinge as she stared helplessly at the bunched-up figure that had been such a gladsome sight to her eyes a few moments ago. When love is over, how little of love even the lover understands, quoted Clovis to himself. Rose Marie was the first to break the silence. If that is Eric you have in your arms, who is that? That, I think, is for you to explain, said Mrs. Mombay stiffly. Obviously, said Clovis, it's a duplicate Eric that your powers of faith called into being. The question is, what are you going to do with him? The ashen pallor deepened in Rose Marie's cheeks. Mrs. Momby clutched the genuine Eric closer to her side, as though she feared that her uncanny neighbour might out of sheer pique turn him into a bowl of goldfish. "'I found him sitting in the middle of the road,' said Rose Marie weakly. "'You can't take him back and leave him there,' said Clovis. "'The highway is meant for traffic.' not to be used as a lumber-room for disused miracles. Rose Marie wept. The proverb, Weep and you weep alone, broke down as badly on application as most of its kind. Both babies were wailing lugubriously, and the parent mombies had scarcely recovered from their earlier lachrymose condition. Clovis alone maintained an unruffled cheerfulness. "'Must I keep him always?' asked Rosemary dolefully. "'Not always,' said Clovis consolingly. "'He can go into the Navy when he's thirteen. Rosemary wept afresh. "'Of course,' added Clovis, "'there may be no end of bother about his birth certificate. "'You'll have to explain matters to the Admiralty, "'and they're dreadfully hidebound.' It was rather a relief when a breathless nursemaid from the Villa Charlottenburg over the way came running across the lawn to claim little Percy, who had slipped out of the front gate and disappeared like a twinkling from the high road. And even then Clovis found it necessary to go in person to the kitchen to make sure about the asparagus sauce. Here ends the reading of The Quest from the Chronicles of Clovis by H. H. Munro.